So in this last chapter, we actually got confirmation that Ignea has formed his own guild. Whether he was the first guild master or not, because I still have theories and speculations as to whether or not there was a fire god, you know, that ran fire god castle and maybe started fire and flames in theory before Ignea, but that's something that's completely unprecedented right now. We don't have anything to kind of go over that idea, at least at the current point in the story. As far as we know, it is Ignea and has always been Ignea leading fire and flame. So the thing about that I find extremely important and extremely telling is that Mishima has done a lot with the dragon gods in letting us understand bits of them without just outright telling us stuff about them. The only one I would say that really we don't get a lot of information on, like has been quiet all day until I started recording, I know she's going to be loud, she, she knows it's when I'm doing something, she, she's demanding attention, um, but is at a point when we have Viernes and we have his character shown but not really told to us too much. The most we can really go about it is the fact that he seems so solid, uh, so solitary. I'm trying to use words. Such a solo guy that he didn't even really have, you know, minions the same as a lot of these other guys did. He had, you know, fake minions, concept embodiments that have taken form and are going to pretend that they're even real people. But outside of that, whenever we have any of the dragon gods, we have lots of small aspects of their characters that are told to us just through their actions. Like with Merkphobia, we know about his path of redemption and obviously just him doing small things to help anything that he could by any means possible, whether it's like giving food to this village or even just helping the hurt animals in the area of the water. It just tells us like, okay, he's somebody who put in a lot of pain before, but now he's really trying just to find literally any means necessary that he can to give back to make up for what he did. Even if it's not make up for what he did, but to just do everything he can in the time that he's still alive. Whereas someone like Alderaan, Alderaan has, I, I, I think at least probably besides Zygnia, Alderaan has the most interesting just general display information about him like for instance the fact that in his humanoid form unlike the other dragon gods he doesn't take a human-esque appearance he's humanoid but he's still far more tree-like and way more like akin to like what you would expect a a wood being to take on the the shape of yeah i'm gonna be as human as possible without actually like resembling one because i don't like them and then when you have his design you also have the fact that he has this crown and that's really important because the humanoid forms of each of the dragon gods are something they choose to look like. It's not something that they are born with. Their dragon form is their actual appearance and the thing that they are naturally going to look like that they can't control. So whenever they go into these humanoid forms, it's something that in their mind is like, okay, this is how I want to look like. This is what I'm going to do. And it tells us a little bit about, okay, well, why exactly are you going to do that? Why did you decide to look like this? It's not like it's like, oh, yeah, I use this magic and it automatically turns me into my personal, uh, you know, what I would look like if I was human. It's no, you you take on this appearance. And with Alderaan, he's got a crown. And the crown tells us a lot about his arrogance and how he views himself over uh, just like you know, king of, of everything he sees kind of character. You know, he's got 300 plus thousand people that he just uses as, as essentially just food. And stuff like that, Mishima has done a lot with 100 Years Quest to where we don't have to have nearly as much telling for it. So for somebody like Alderaan, where it, you know, as a character that we, we got a lot of just stuff that he put forward to us. Like he obviously was more on the side of dragons, but I'd say more so on him specifically since he is a dragon. Like, based off his personality, if he was any other race, he probably would be trying to strive for absolute presence and, uh, you know, domination over everything around him, regardless of it. He just seemed to have that personality. I mean, you could say that he has that because of his status as a dragon and later a dragon god, but besides the point. I mean, to be fair, he did go back to try and fight Acnologia, so it's like he had to at least set somewhat of an ego prior to getting to Dragon God status, the fact he thought he was going to be able to handle that fight. But regardless of which, we have Ignea right now who is doing a lot of that, and I think more so, because with Alderaan, Alderaan gave us 
bits of information about him and then through means of action and his appearance we're able to find out a little bit more but with that i think there was it was limited to what we were going to get in that arc and with ignia there's going to be a lot more because the big difference between Igni and Alderaan is obviously Igni is a character that is being played out far more over a much larger expanse of the story. I gotta get a haircut at some point. Look at I got this hat. My hair's not normally this long. But uh, with Ignia, we're seeing everything laid out and we're gonna be seeing it more and more as the story goes. And the thing about Ignia that I think has a huge advantage over not just other antagonists within the series, but other antagonists in general is he's got a lot of pre-existing stuff coming into the story that he, you know, wouldn't have unless he was connected to, obviously, somebody like Igneal and Natsu. You have information, obviously, of, you know, who his father is. You know why he was in hiding. You, you know, we know exactly how he connects to the main character. It's not like Zareph when he's introduced and that was part of the mystery. We know what it is with Ignea. It's just we don't know exactly what got him to this point entirely. You know, we're missing just kind of key details. So that's something that we're going to be seeing as his arc goes on. And why I think that's really important is with the fact that he started a guild, we have the whole bit of, well, why? We had Selene. Selene likes humans, but Selene didn't start a guild. Uh, we have Alderaan, who had the means to start a guild, even if it's not indirectly like as his minions, but he could have easily had a guild or two just within his cities for defensive purposes or things like that. Um, with Viernes, Viernes went and took over another guild, so that's a little bit different. It's not like his, his whole thing was he really wanted a guild. And with Ignea, there's... There's something about it that when you when you look at how he talks to people, how he interacts with, you know, with the Signarius sisters, we assume they're human. At least based off of the current spot. I personally, I have the theory that they're actually dragons, either natural or artificial, who knows. But for now, it's the fact that we, you know, the safest assumption is that they're just humans. And with Brian, we don't know what exactly Brian is. I really like the idea that the dragon gods... Uh, you know, for the most part, obviously they're not really for humans, but with the difference between them and Ignea is Ignea not growing up in a dragon, uh, you know, ruled society, that he is more so going to kind of just develop his own outlook on things and his own view on the other races and strength and where exactly it can come from. So if you had, for instance, you had, um, you know, maybe the, you know, in theory, let's just say the Signario sisters are actually dragon eaters or something, and Brian is a, is a demon, but because of the value and potential uses that they can provide to Ignea, he ends up saying like, yeah, come on, you're, you guys are with me now. And I think that would be a huge tell for us about just his character without having to him have him go in depth about oh yeah these are my outlooks and my ideals because it shows us that through action and in contrast to the other dragon gods why exactly he's different and why exactly he's like that because now we have the fact that again as starting a guild why is a guild important guilds are something that were human created dragons generally don't like humans very much they treat them as cattle the only other ones you know there's there's a very big seemingly set obviously on either you are very anti-human or you're very pro-human with the dragons there's not a lot of like in between the lines Ignea seems more like he's more out for himself and he he likes obviously his his race but at the same time he's not as hateful towards the humans he seems more of like yeah i gotta do stuff for like the other dragons but you know the the other races that are in either value to me or interesting to me i'm gonna you know treat them more so in interest to myself it's kind of like how acnologia wouldn't talk to humans but he would talk to spare you know special characters like he talked to um you know he talked to Zeref, he talked to igneal obviously dragon and dragon slayer uh, you know, wait, no, sorry. I was about to say with Irene, I had to include Irene in there, Dragon and Dragon Slayer between Igneal and uh, Irene, and then Zareph being an immortal, you know, a character that is, you know, human in origin, but has broken into kind of his own thing. But it's in the idea that they have their own little things where it's like once you have their attention, 
there's a specific reason for that. And that specific reason can tie back into the ideals and understanding about said character. Now, with this Dark Guild, I really want to see, you know, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped to see other members. I want to see their emblem. But I really am, am looking forward to seeing more general interactions between the members of Fire and Flame and Ignea without having any of the main cast members or any of the other Dragon Gods present. And we get a little bit of that in this chapter with him just talking to the Signario sisters. But he's he's not talking down to them like they're nothing. Like, in the idea of, like, say they are human, he's not talking to them like they're insects. They're clearly still people below him. But he's he's just trying to... He seems more like he's just having conversation with them. He, it's not like we're Alderaan. Alderaan would literally just look at the people as food. Ignea looks at them, again, as his underlings. He looks at them more so it's like... Yeah, you guys are, you know, feeble in comparison, but you guys are on my side. So it's like you guys, are, by default, are better than relatively anybody else. Which, again, is something I like because it almost builds a level of camaraderie with Ignea. And we know that Dogermag is the only person that he views as a friend. You know, he openly says that, like, yeah, Dogermag was my buddy. But with the other people, I, I, I'm a fan of the idea similar to... In contrast to the Fairy Tale Guild, obviously anybody with in their guild is you know a, you know a member of the family you know in you know they got their backs. But with Ignea, it seems kind of like that, but more so like an unspoken version. And all of the major guilds have had their own kind of like general thing. Well, you know we had Sabretooth was more of like the idea of like if Laxus took over and it was more militarized. You had uh, Tartaros was way more so mission above everything else the members are, are are expendable with grimoire heart you had everybody in it is out for themselves it's a dog eat dog kind of scenario and they are so low strength above everyone else i really like the idea that with fire and flame it's similar ask to the fairy tale guild but not so much as kind of like a oh you know oh yeah you're on our team you're a family member now but it's more so like ignea only looks out for the people on his team like if he would never admit to it but he has like an all kind of a kind of like appreciation of anybody that is like recognizable in his crew i think that would be really cool again even if he never says it we could just see it in action like if you were going to have some form of scenario where one of the members where he maybe at one point shows that he has a little bit of interest in, he finds them as a person or like a, a fighter or somebody's like, you know what, that guy's got some spirit. And then there's a bit where they almost get killed. Maybe in scenario, let's say you have some of the members fight Diablos members. Like there's like some form of, of chain of events that leads some Fire and Flames members and Diablos and members into, into combat. And it seems like one of the members of Fire and Flames is about to get killed. Now, maybe the other members of Fire and Flames are like, oh, well, that's his own fault for being weak. But maybe Ignea, like, steps in and does something to kind of be like, all right, enough's enough. I got to kind of, like, actually put myself out there. And it's not just, oh, you know, I got to rep my guild. But it's like, as long as somebody's a member of Fire and Flames, I got their back. I think that would be really telling for somebody who is a survivor of Acnologia's whole genocide campaign if anybody that Ignea takes in, it's similar to how, like, the Fairy Tale Guild is, but it's less so like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a family thing, but it's more in the lines of, if they're under me, they're, they're not untouchable, but I won't allow any of my members to die because it maybe it, like, relates back to Ignea thinking about when he was on the run from Acnologia, and the idea of seeing these other dragons die would really get to him. Because maybe at one point he had more dragon friends and there were other dragons he liked or maybe there were some humans he liked you know at, at a point where it was just kind of him and he was growing up with nobody and he ended up befriending a couple humans or something and that's why maybe he takes on a couple human customs but you know events happen that led to their death so he tries to prevent that but he plays more into this aggressive style to where he's like yeah anybody that's with me uh, i'm not gonna you know if I, if I can i'm not gonna let him die because you know, obviously, like, there, there's people that I have recognized and acknowledged the value of. So, you know, they're going to be pretty much off the table, ultimately. So, this is something that I have been really, really hyped for going into this arc. I've talked about it a good amount of times in other videos about how there's aspects of Ignea that seem less 
traditional of a dragon, but not so much as where Selene is very, you know, much of a human appreciator and likes their kind of culture and style more so seemingly than her own dragon nature. Whereas Ignea, like to me, it seems like, I guess it'd be like this. If you think of it something like there's like, you know, you had a civilization and you have, uh, I, I was going to say something about like Pompeii, but I'll just, I'll just pick a fictional place just to make it a little easier. So you have Atlantis, you have three members of Atlantis that were gone, you know, out doing whatever trade at the time of when Atlantis collapses and, you know, and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. It's like the first guy, traditional dude, he's like, I need to resurrect the Atlantean Empire and bring us back to glory. The next person you don't even really know is an Atlantean. Maybe they want to blend in with the environment and you know, then modern culture, and they don't want anybody to know too much about them. They're like, no, our time's over. We need to kind of just go on with the times. And the last person is where I would think Igneo would be, where Igneo is almost like a hybrid, where he's like, well, I want to live in this kind of like general time, but I also like my people, but there's there's differences and things that i can learn from these other guys that maybe would prevent the end because you got to look at that too maybe he he'll look at the the faults that led up to acnologia it lead up to trying to prevent it because it's not like acnologia just woke up and he's like yeah mass murder time it was something that triggered on his end as well so if say if ignia found out information on it and he's like well we we need to make sure that you know stuff like this doesn't happen again and maybe in his mind, it's like, oh, well, I don't necessarily want to side with the humans, but the dragons were kind of at fault in that scenario too. So he ends up looking at it more as it's not about being a human or a dragon. It's about yourself and your own stance with your own power and your own capabilities. Because maybe that's where he'll look at someone like Igneal, you know, why he took on Natsu. Look at Acnologia and how this human who became a dragon was able to beat all these other natural born dragons. And I think that would be really cool because it would also really parallel Natsu's whole viewpoint of it doesn't really matter if you're a human or a dragon. It's more so about you as the individual and your own thoughts and actions and experiences. And if you took that with Ignea and really pushed that in his own direction, I think that would be amazing to how it would you know, run parallel to Natsu is they essentially have the same mindset, but it's just showing where that same mindset can differ and to where the roads can split. And again, you have the same kind of thing like, oh yeah, it's about the person, but with him, it's more like, yeah, I want to kind of have my domain of dominance and power, but in a manner that it's like, it doesn't matter where you're born. It's how you grasp that power and how you climb the ladder and, you know, fight tooth and nail in order to achieve that position. We'll see. I mean, obviously, he has this plan about the whole uh, return of the Age of Dragons and the Dogre Labyrinth has some form of connection into his plan. We'll probably not only see, like, a little bits as the art goes. I, I don't imagine we're going to find out in full exactly of what his plan is so soon. But I imagine that like it's going to be one of those things where every single time he has a major talking point, maybe he alludes to it or gives us a little bit more of, of inside information. So at the moment, I mean, my cat, is she, she, she knows. She's like, yeah, I heard you're getting ready to try and wrap up the video. Let me scream some more. Um, but as it goes, this arc, I think every single time that we see Igni on screen, he's going to be giving us something to, to really kind of open up this understanding of his character. Because at the moment... I, I think every time we really get him, it's it's always been a real pleasure just to see exactly what he brings to the table. What is he telling us? What what do his actions generally direct towards and mean? And with this, uh, like I said, it, it, at least from what we've seen, you can really draw the lines of where he's at now and the, the theories that I was putting out in this video about you know him having this you know, independent stance between anti-human and anti-dragon and more so of just this more aggressive version of how Natsu sees things, as it being more about the individual. Because it's not just based off of nothing, it's based off of things that he's done and things that are in the series that make sense to what he's doing and will you know, fill in those holes that we're talking about. Because like I said, he has a lot of things that already we understand about him and we know about him, but we just don't 
know the you know the information in between each bit that we have about him to connect everything to make entire sense over his character so there's that comment below tell me your thoughts are about this i mean like i said i i was so stoked when we had fire and flame drop i assume may, oh maybe it was it's like a religious cult and we'll get another cult group but it's straight a dark guild you know bringing back dark guilds and it's like the last one we had that was like a big deal, obviously tartaros and tartaros was a massive massive part of the story even though obviously alvarez was a much bigger uh, looming threat tartaros had such a massive rift and ripple into events in the story that it you know it forced a time skip and not like with alvarez it was like yeah it was more of like a cooldown time skip whereas tartaros was a rest recovery and therapy pretty much time skip you know happened to, to, to get stronger because of the level of damage they went through and there's a very strong potential that maybe Ignea is going to be putting out the same kind of things. I mean, at, at the moment, the only thing that's keeping absolute devastation is the fact that he seems to, you know, want to kind of take some more note and watch things transpire. So we'll see how this all plays out. And other than that, like I said, comment below. Tell me your thoughts are about this. And uh, check out my other videos. Brother than that, I appreciate it. Already subscribed. Thank you all for listening.